Oh man, welcome. Hey, so excited uh, that we're about to jump into this series again. We've been walking through the book of Acts. And so if you're here with us and you're going, hey, I've always wanted to know why the church is here. Like, what's it about? Why is it important? Um, Why do I keep seeing this or experiencing this? Well, that's what the book of Acts is about. This is what Jesus started when he was raised from the dead. This was his big idea. And so that's what we're talking through. So wherever you're joining us from, whether you're online, whether you're at another campus, whether you're here in the room, um, we're continuing this journey together, so I'm pretty pumped about it. Uh, But we're in a series called All Things New, because everything's new right now. It's, it's, everything is like right fresh on the scene. And so we're discovering a lot of things at this moment. And today we're going to discover a new disturbance, a new disturbance. The church shows up in the city And it causes a disturbance. How many of you have been disturbed? Real quick, just show of hands. Been disturbed, like on the way to church this today, right? You were like, I was disturbed, and I've been trying to get back on my feet from that. Like, we've all had those moments. So everybody, remember the last time you were really disturbed, and just dwell on it, and then let's all get a little frustrated together. You know what I mean? Like, that's a healthy healthy thing for us to do. Um, My family and I experienced a disturbing moment all together uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, We were in the car. And um, so we live in Richmond Hill, and we're on our way to church, by the way. My wife reminded me that we we're on the way to an Easter service. So it's like a double whammy here. Um, and, you know, in my neighborhood or in my exit here off of the interstate, they just installed these roundabouts. Over the last year, they've been doing this construction. And, you know, so it was one of those things that was like, for the last year, we've been disturbed because we're like, how is this whole thing going to play out, you know? And, uh, and so finally we get on the roundabout, but I'm a big fan of the roundabouts. Personally, it makes me feel more sophisticated, like I'm from a different country or something. So I'm like, look at me, I'm on a roundabout. Um, but, but we're all still discovering how this thing works. Some of you in this room still don't know how this works. So it, yeah, I'm already getting amens, come on. Look, if you're in the circle, you win. Like you keep going, you don't stop. In, uh, so, okay. So we don't know how this works, right? We're figuring it out. Some of you are like, wait a second, that's how this? Yes, if you're in it, you win. You just keep going until you find your spot. Okay, anyways, that's not the disturbing part. That was a disturbing part. So one day, heading to Easter, um, we noticed that this line getting uh, getting on the interstate was backed way up. And we're like, oh man, this is bad news. Someone doesn't understand how to use a roundabout. Is somebody's, someone's just sitting there and it's created all kind of chaos everywhere. And so, or worse, worse on 95, 95 might be backed up from 16. If you don't know what that means, for some reason, we decided to do construction on every exit in Savannah at the same time. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) We're all getting a little disturbed. You feel it? Okay. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Okay. So we're creeping. We're creeping up here. And we're finally getting, and we're all, we're, you can feel the tension in the van rising. It's amazing. And so we finally get up here, and we ri- realize it's not the roundabout, it's 95. And it's going to take a minute. But what we noticed is that people were getting out of the line, getting on the roundabout, and then breaking in. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were not playing by the rules. And so by the time we get up to go onto the exit, we see this truck get, go out of the lane, get into the roundabout, because that means they win, and then get right in front of us. And our van explodes. I'm talking all six of us, same time, freaking out, going like, you can't do that, blah. Like my four-year-old's doing like baby kid cuss words. We're all like, let me out. I mean, we're like chasing them down the slow moving interstate. We're like, this is, you can't, there's this way this works. And after five, I'm not kidding, five minutes, all six of us are yelling at the same time. And for five, and then after five minutes, my wife and I go like, what are we doing? Like, why, why is this so disturbing? Like, why did this drive us nuts? And it's because there's a way things work. There's an order to things. And some people like to do it their way. And it breaks the order of how things should work. So let me ask you a question. Let's flip it real quick. How many of you are the disturbance? How many of you have your way? 
You're the person who's like, I'm not sitting in this line. And so you just do your way. Some of you right now are like, oh man, oh man, uncomfortable, uncomfortable. <laughs> um, some of you cause a disturbance. Now let me just, let's, let's twist this a little bit. As followers of Jesus, we operate according to the way and the order of the kingdom of heaven now. It, we switched sides. We have a new plan. We have a new order in which we live, a new way in which we live. And there are moments when the order in which we live for the kingdom creates a disturbance in our world. There's a moment when following Jesus is going to disturb and annoy the people around you. You are the disturbance. In fact, there are some of you in the room, you're not followers of Jesus, you're like, I'm not a Christian, I was invited here, I'm coming, and you actually agree with me right now. You're like, yeah, Christians are annoying. They are disturbing. Like, there's, they're holding on to things that it feels like the rest of us have moved past, or they're, they're doing things, they're practicing things, they're saying things that we all know aren't true anymore. We've got better information now. And so you're looking at us going like, why do you still do some of the things that you do? Well, I'm glad you're here. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna peel back the curtain a little bit, and you're gonna see why Christians do. Why do we act or think the way that we think? How come we keep disturbing things here? It's like we're operating according to a different way than the way of our world. It creates disturbance. So today, what I want us to learn is how do we disturb people well? It's gonna happen. If you're following Jesus, it's gonna create a disturbance. But how do we do it well? We don't wanna be mean about it. We don't wanna be belligerent. We wanna be in love, but disturbing things. That's what we're all about. That's what Acts 4 is actually about. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 4. If you didn't bring one with you, uh, there's one in the seat right there around you, or we're gonna put the passages up here. But this is a pretty special journey that we're on walking through the book of Acts. So I wanna encourage you, if you have a Bible, bring it with you and get to know your Bible as we're going through this series. If you don't have a Bible, come talk to any one of us and we will get you one, okay? Because it's that important. Uh, but as we go through Acts 4, uh, we're gonna see how do we disturb our world well. All right, verse one, chapter four. So the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because that's what happens. They were disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. You see, this incident that happened, remember, Peter and John had just healed a guy, okay? And this incident that had happened in the city caught the attention of the city leaders. And so here, Peter and John, though, because they caught the attention, they, they healed this guy, a crowd gathered. Peter goes, well, obviously, I need to preach to them because that's what you do with crowds. And so he's preaching, and all of a sudden, Peter and John are stepping on the territory of these leaders. You see, the priests and the Sadducees, along with the Pharisees, they were all the primary teachers. They were the primary, they, they kind of held the reins of the direction of the culture in Jerusalem. They were the ones who were in charge. They were the ones who had all the power, essentially. Rome would come to this group of leaders to get things done in Jerusalem, all right? And now this group of nobodies, Peter and John, following this guy who was just crucified, this group of nobodies is, is causing a disturbance Verse three, look what happens. So they seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they just put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed so that the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000 people. All right, so here's what's happening. The message of Jesus is having an effect. It's creating momentum. It's moving things. It's changing things to the point where they can't even like count the people. So they're like, well, let's just count the guys. And so it's like, all right, well, I guess it's about 5,000 guys. So, so the movement that Jesus started is beginning to kind of take shape and, and, and create more and more uh, energy. But here's what I want you to understand. Pick up from this. This is the first time that we actually see being a follower of Jesus costing them something. This is the first time after the resurrection, okay? After the resurrection of Jesus, he starts this new thing. It's amazing. It's powerful. It's exploding. But this is the first moment where it's going to cost them something. A night in prison. Verse five. Now, 
The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law, they met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? You see, in that room, there are a lot of powerful names. I mean, this is, this is a list of the high priest's family. It's a list of all these people who, in the city, when they do something, they say something, and people move. And so they're going like, by what name are you doing this? Where are you getting your, the, the power from here? Because you realize what's happening. They feel like their power is being threatened. They had a way of things. There was an order to the city. And they feel like someone is changing that. Someone's doing it their way and is disrupting things. Verse eight, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. So remember in Acts 1, 8, kind of go back to the very beginning. Jesus said, hey, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, okay? So this is a picture of what was said in verse, chapter one, verse eight. This is a picture of this happening. So Peter, filled with the Spirit, then becomes a witness for him. All right, he says, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Remember, the whole thing got started because Peter and John looked at a guy who from birth has not been able to use his legs, looked at him and said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And this guy stood up and started walking. And I think Peter is just trying to make a real clear distinction. Hey, there's nothing special about us. There's, a, look, there's one name. Jesus' name, that's the one that has power. He's the one that can do the impossible. He's the one that's showing up in powerful ways, and he's only, this is only the beginning of what Jesus intends to do. Because Peter goes on and keeps preaching, verse eight. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, the foundation, the beginning of this new thing. That's what a cornerstone is. Now, everybody take a deep breath with me real quick. Because you need oxygen in your brain for this next verse. Salvation is found in no one else. If you've never heard this, I need you to hear this. Salvation, hope for eternity, hope for forgiveness, hope for restored identity, it's not found anywhere else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we can be saved. It doesn't, it doesn't come anywhere else. The ultimate healing, he says, is salvation. And that's the one that lasts for eternity. These stories of healing, they're so powerful because it shows us, yes, with Jesus, all things are actually possible. And he even shows that through his people, there are things that were once impossible that are now possible. But he wants you to realize the greater miracle is the work of eternal salvation. Jesus is the one who set the hope for eternity, but it requires you to build your life on him. It requires you to build your life on who he is. He's the cornerstone. That's what Peter is quoting from Psalm 118, uh, verse 22. He's making the point that Jesus, you rejected him. Remember, you guys were the ones who crucified him. But God raised him from the dead, and from him, he's become this cornerstone. That means he's the first foundation. And as the foundation, he has set the direction of the rest of the building. That's what a cornerstone does. And so he's saying that Jesus is the foundation and direction for every follower. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said these words. No, you need to understand, I am the way. I'm the cornerstone. I started this thing, and I'm showing you how this is going to work. I'm the way. There isn't another one that's going to work for you. I am the truth. I'm the only one that's going to last. And the I am the life. And so if you're, if you're building your life on something else, you're going to miss these things. You're going to miss the way. You're going to miss the truth. You're going to miss life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is where we understand the truth of salvation is a double-edged sword. 
On one side, you see God's grace because God clearly says, look, look, if you're looking for hope, it's Jesus. If you're looking for salvation, it's found in Jesus. He gave his life for this and then be death to prove it. All right, so if you're looking for it, that's where it is. But the other side is judgment, the fact that there is no other way to salvation. There is no other way that's going to be sufficient enough to give you what you're looking for. So just as a point I want to make here, if, if you haven't considered Jesus, if you're here today and you're at least curious about what, we're, what Christians believe, what a follower of Jesus is, who Jesus is, if you're at least curious, I want to invite you, take seriously what it looks like to consider him, to consider putting your trust in him. Test it. See if this is reliable. See if Jesus is who he said that he is. Kind of seek these things out. Because if it is true that it is only by Jesus' name that you are saved, then this is a big decision, decision that you need to make. But even if you prove us wrong, even if you prove us wrong, your life will get better as you get closer to Jesus. As you even get to see him, things will get better for you because he is amazing. And so I want you to consider him. But we're going to keep moving because we've got a lot to cover. Verse 13. So when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, I love that. This is one of those things that reminds me that, yeah, Scripture's authentic. It's reliable. It's not worked over. Because the people who wrote this would not have wrote this about themselves. Right? Whenever somebody who's in charge writes their own story, they write things like, and he was a mighty warrior and he faced fear. No, they looked at Peter and John and said, well, that guy's dumb and that guy's just plain ordinary. Okay, so, so this, one, this is one of those passages that just proves to me like you can bank on this. So they looked at him unschooled, ordinary, but they were astonished and they took note. Man, listen to this. These men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. I mean, what would you say? How'd this guy get healed? Jesus? What are they going to say? Like, no, he didn't. The guy's standing right there. He's proving the whole thing right in front of him. Now, in a little bit, we're going to come back to this idea of courage, but I want to take a moment to point this out. If, as a follower of Jesus, if you've ever felt a little lack of confidence, like, I'm scared to share my story, or I'm share, scared to, like, stand for Jesus, or I'm concerned, like, I don't know if I'm going to have all the right answers, or I don't, so I don't, I don't think I know enough, or I'm not very good at speaking about this, so I don't know if I've got everything it, I, I need to, to speak clearly about who Jesus is in my life, or maybe I'm concerned because I'm not a pastor. I don't, I don't know. What I, that's somebody else's job. By the way, every pastor has felt those same things. But you point, just realize this. This is precisely what the religious leaders saw in Peter and John. Unschooled, ordinary dudes. They were mind blown. So Peter and John, these were the guys who didn't really make it in school. He was probably the first kid that kind of tempted you to get, go get a cigarette, smoke with me. They stole them from his daddy. He's like, dude, check this out, right? That's who we're talking about. That's the kid who didn't, couldn't cut it. And they were astonished because something happens when you spend time with Jesus. Something in you changes the more you spend time with him. Verse 15, let's look at this. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, which is the kind of like judicial court in Jerusalem made up of all these different city leaders. And they conferred together. What are we gonna do with these guys? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed the notable sign and we cannot deny it. We would deny it, but we can't because he's right there, okay? But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak any longer, or no longer in, to the na anyone in this name. So after this big ju judicial court hearing, they arrive at the fact that they could say, stop it. That's all they can do. So, verse 18, they called him in and said, stop. Do not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You see, the Sanhedrin, they're used to being in charge. They're the ones that when they speak, people listen. When they advise, people do what they say. When they instruct, 
The answer is yes, sir. But what they haven't understood yet is that for Peter and John, there's a greater voice at work. There's a greater and higher court that they're listening to. And so now someone else is in charge. Look at verse 19. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? That's the greater voice. That's the higher court. Which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? Now you be the judges, but as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is their mic drop moment. You know what I mean? Like this, this is the first time real persecution shows up, right? This is the first time that they're actually face to face with, is this for real? Because if the resurrection was not real, if it was just a, a, a hoax that they're trying to, Jesus is a really good <clears throat> teacher and so they're trying to maintain this thing. But look, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, the, the apostles would have balked at this and they would have said, it's not worth it. They would have said, nope. If he's, he's a really good teacher, but he's not worth going to jail for. Or maybe Jesus started this community of people that loved each other really good and they were kind of like living life together in an amazing way. But it's gonna cost you your job. It could potentially land you in prison. They're going, I think I'm good. But if the resurrection means that Jesus is Lord and it means that Jesus is the only way of forgiveness, and if it means that only through Jesus will you ever discover your truest identity, and if it means that through Jesus you will experience peace and joy for eternity, if it means that God is bringing his kingdom through Jesus being established in the church, man, if that's what the resurrection means, then this is just the beginning of their courage and as they're pursuing this. So instead of turning and running from the opposition, they look city leaders right in the eye and they say like, look, we cannot help but we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. We operate according to a higher voice, a higher authority than this room, and nothing you can say is going to change that. That's the moment they're in. And so they wrap up this section, verse 21. Look at this. After further threats, they just let them go. They could not, understand, they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Almost everybody in Jerusalem knew who that guy was. And now he's standing. Something happened. A great disturbance has happened. So there are a few things I want us to focus on as we kind of get through this. Um, as we're trying to figure out, as followers of Jesus, we're going to create a disturbance in our world. How do we do it right? How do we follow Jesus well, even when it's at odds with our world? So there are two questions I want us to ask. Here's the first question. What determines what's right for you? Who determines what's right for you? That's an important question. That's the question they asked. So for some of us, we have friends and family. They, they help us determine what's right, right? You, I mean, you're in a relationship. You're like, how do you know if they're the one that I'm supposed to marry? Well, you go to friends and family and you're asking like, what do you think? And they're like, they're terrible. And it's like, I don't agree with you. Okay, anyways, but you know, friends and family, we turn to them like, what, how do I raise kids? I had a teenager, they were this way one day and I don't know them now. And so how do you parent a teenager? That's one of the questions that you go to your friends and family for. What do you think about vaccines? What do you think about masks? How are we supposed to do life now? We go to friends and family to help us determine what's right. You know, for some of us, a pretty high voice is our political party. You know, we think like, I'm a Democrat, and these are the things that are right, and this is what I'm going to fight for. And for some of us, we're going, like, I'm a Republican, and these are things that, I'm, that are right, and this is what I'm fighting for. And we're all going like, well, I don't really know, but all I really am confident of is they're wrong, right? So, so our political party can sometimes be the voice that helps us determine what's right. What about cultural agendas? What about the movies and, and series that we're streaming like crazy? They're trying to normalize certain things, cultural agendas in our world, that the more and more we see them, the more different it looks from what we read. What about those things that are trying to teach us? No, 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 this is right now. This, this counts. 
You know, what about, you know, we're looking at famous people or influencers and we're going like, help me determine who's right. And all those things, you can get wisdom from all those things. But all those things are secondary. If you're a follower of Jesus, those things are secondary. What is primary is what does God to say is right? You see, for Peter and John, sitting across the table from some of the most powerful men in the city who are saying things like, you need to stop talking about Jesus or things are going to get worse for you. But they kept it simple. And I want to invite you, keep this really simple. They listened to God and did whatever he said. They listened to God and did whatever he said. Whatever God determined as right was right for them. So I want to give us an example of how, how as followers of Jesus, we process these things. So, um, and in fact, what I want to do is I want to talk about abortion for a minute. Now, can we just acknowledge real quick, this is a hypersensitive topic. This one's real sensitive. For a lot of reasons, whether politically or, or personally, my guess is that a lot of you are probably going to tune me out as I kind of walk through this. But can I challenge you? Let's wade through a difficult conversation together. Can we try that? Let's wade through a, a difficult topic together because I want you to see something. I want you to see that the church can do something that no political party can figure out. The church can help you discover a third way, another option, what we actually know to be the way. All right, so, so please kind of walk with me through this. As we ask the same question that Peter and John ask, they start with, what does God say is right? So let's go to his word. Let's look at what God says is right. And when we look at scripture, we see, that what, see what God says about human life. And as Jesus' church, we cannot agree with or affirm abortion. It can't happen. You can't look at the words in the heart of God and think that he is in it at all okay with this. In fact, I want to read for you a portion of our statement of faith that we've been committed to since the beginning of our church. This is a portion. You can find this on our website. I want to read it for you. You see, we believe that all people, all human life, keyword all, all human life is sacred and created by God in his image. And all of those things come from different passages in Scripture. This is crafted from a, a number of passages. Human life is of inestimable worth in all its dimensions, including pre-born babies, the aged, the physically or mentally challenged, and every other stage or condition from conception through natural death. We therefore are called, listen to this, as a church, we are therefore called to defend, protect, and value all human life. That's our stance. That's what it's been for a long time. Now, and, and, and I want to encourage you, maybe pursue some of this on your own. You know, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 in particular, talk about why this is such a big thing for us. But again, from 1964, this is how we've seen the sanctity of life. This is, this is how we started. We've been committed to this, and it hasn't changed based on decisions made by a Supreme Court. We answer to a much higher court. All right, so please hear me. We are both against abortion and for the health and well-being of these mothers, regardless of their decisions. We're on both sides. Okay? Okay? Because I need you to understand something. Our goal is to honor the value of that life of the unborn child while at the same time showing the gentle, loving compassion of Jesus to the mother. Because you gotta know, you gotta know that on the other side of every decision is a story of fear, of anxiety, of regret and guilt and shame, and anger, and neglect. I mean, all of these things are behind every one of these decisions. And please hear me. This is precisely where Jesus wants to meet you. And he wants to walk with you through this because he is the master at taking a mess and bringing beauty out of ashes. This is what he does. He's a master at it. 
And so hear this, hear this. No matter where you are, who you are, what you've done, God's love is greater. Now, some of you can't even hear these words, but I want you to really try. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God's love is greater. And some of you in this room have been carrying this secret boulder for a long time. And you feel like you're the only one who has to carry the weight of this. You're the, every time you look in the mirror, what you see is your pain or your shame. And you just figure, this is how life is for me now. And I just wanted you to know, there are people in this room who have been exactly where you are. And they can help you discover healing. They can help you discover hope in Jesus. In fact, at the end of this service, we're going to have our prayer team up here. If, if, you've, if you are willing to at least take a courageous step and pursue healing in this, then come find me. Come talk to me, and I'll introduce you to some people who have been where you have been, and they can walk you through this. Don't keep holding this thing. Let's do this. Let's walk out of this. If you're online, you can even request prayer right now, and our team will connect with you. But guys, we got to understand, she needs to experience the love of Jesus through the church. She needs that. She needs someone to fight for her. That's why we partner with amazing ministries like Thrive, because Thrive meets with these mothers who are considering abortion or they're needing help and support post-abortion. We partner with Thrive because they're right in the fight with this. We partner with Love One because Love One helps, find, helps these aging kids find a forever home because they're, they feel like they're forgotten and, and that the church is stepping up and letting them know that Jesus hasn't forgotten anybody. We're working to foster compassion by engaging in the foster care system because we want to step into the brokenness. We want to do exactly what Jesus did, take the compassion right in the suffering of our city and see hope come with him. Are we perfect at this? Not at all. But are we trying to do it right? Are we trying to, do, are we trying to create a godly disturbance here? Yeah. We are trying to do whatever we can to love our city with the compassion of Jesus. So we need to hold on to this question. What is right to God? It's right for us. This is our mantra. Whatever's right for him, that's right for me. Let's keep it simple there. That's the voice that we hold on to. But that's not enough, actually. There's one more question you need to ask for us to actually begin to see things change. The question is then, how do we find the courage to do what is right? What does God say is right is one thing. Finding the courage to then do what is right is a totally different thing altogether. Like Princess Anna in Frozen 2 says, how do we do the next right thing? Y'all got, got me, right? It's a tough thing. They wrote a movie about it. You should watch it. No, I'm just kidding. But courage, how do we find the courage? How do, we find, how do we find courage here? You see, courage is the ability to do the very thing that we're afraid of. When we face our fear straight up, this is the one thing I don't want to have to deal with. Courage is the ability to step right up to that fear and do the right thing regardless. Remember what the leaders said about Peter and John. They, were, they saw their courage. It was their courage. They, and then they go, well, what, is it because of their education? And they said, no. Well, is it because they were just special people? No, they're unschooled and unordinary. Well, what is it? What is it that instilled this courage in them to stand up and shake a city? What was it? Is the fact that they had been with Jesus. And there's something about being with Jesus that changes everything. So what does it mean to be with Jesus? I want to give you two things. The first thing is this. you got to see Jesus for who he really is. Right now, if I say, hey, who is Jesus? And a picture in your mind comes, to, uh, comes up. I'm a little nervous as to what some pictures of Jesus you have in your head. But in this journey of being with Jesus, you're going to discover who he really is. You see, Peter and John, they had, they had followed him for three years. They had, they had watched him and seen how he responded to different situations. They had seen his daily rhythms of being in relationship with the Father. They had seen him confront things that didn't line up to his kingdom. You see, they had watched as he loved those that everyone else neglected. They saw that, couldn't unsee that. They watched him calm a storm with his words. And then the waves listened. They'd watched the most powerful man who's ever walked the earth kneel down and tell a funny story to a child. They saw him do that. 
They saw him. They saw what made him laugh. So it made him weep. They saw him butchered on a cross. And then they saw him on the other side of the grave, living, breathing, eating, unstoppable. They'd seen these things. Couldn't unsee it. Couldn't unhear what they heard from him. See, some of us, we've developed this spiritual stutter step where we trip over things of faith because we second guess things that we're not convinced of. We second guess like who he is or what he's capable of. We haven't spent the time to get to know who Jesus really is. But that's why as a church we're devoted to the word. This is the best way, it's the most clear way for you to begin to see and to hear who God is and then you'll recognize it when it's happening around you. This is what helps you understand the mind of God. This is why we're constantly saying like, get in the word, join us as we're reading through the New Testament, be a part of this thing. Because your ability to be courageous in facing these things that you're afraid of, it's directly related to the time that you spend with Jesus. There's something about him that helps you know how to do the right thing, to have the courage to stand up because the closer you get to him, the more you begin to live out Romans 8, 31, which is this idea of if our God is for us. Man, think about that. If God is actually for you, what can stand against you? What in this life is greater? Nothing. But again, get to know who he really is, but then submit to his direction. Remember the cornerstone. Jesus is the foundation. He's the beginning. He's the one who determines how this house is going to be built. He's the one who determines the direction. So let me ask you, let's just keep it simple again. It's an invitation. Build your life in alignment with his will. That's submitting to his direction. Submit yourself, build yourself in alignment with his will. Make it simple. Whatever God says is right determines your next step. Whatever he says, just do that. You see, courage, it's costly. For the apostles, it landed them in prison. I don't know what it's done for you yet, but heads up, all around our world, that still happens. This, this courage to pursue Jesus is costing people. But courage is also contagious. Oh, my goodness. Next, in the next week, we're going to talk about what, what this courage lights up in the body. And so come back and hear the rest of this story. But there's something about courage that is contagious. When you see it, you want to be a part of it. When you see it, something lights up in you. Because listen, guys, there are things in our world that are still left undone. There are things in our world that are still stuck in brokenness. There's some of us in this room, you are stuck in your brokenness. And what it requires is one person with courage, just one person to actually believe that if God is for me, nothing can stand against me. And if just one person stands up in courage, it breaks things wide open. It creates a disturbance for us. Man, listen, if we see something that doesn't line up with the kingdom, it is our moment to stand in courage against the very thing that we face and cause a divine disturbance. That's part of the mission. So I dare you, I dare you to just pick one day and live like this. Get your, get your phone out and say like Tuesday. Tuesday's my day. Where you'd where you ask, what does God say is right? And then you find the courage and do it. Just pick one day. Let's start simple. Wake up Tuesday. All right, God, what do you say is right? And help me find the courage to do what he says. Let's see what happens. Father, we're thankful. Thankful for your grace. Thankful for how good you are. We're so thankful that we get an opportunity to read your word like this. And your word is like a mirror where you hold it up and we look and we see how things really are in our own lives. And so I pray that as we have lifted up your word today and we have seen how things really are in our lives, we know clearly what we need to do next. We have a clear picture of who we need to become, of what needs to change, of what we need to repent of, of what we need to keep fighting for, whatever it is. God, help us to live to the high calling of being part of your church. We love you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen.
Thanks for watching Compassion Online. We'd love to invite you to join us for our live services with worship, prayer partners, and more. For exclusive online content, head to live.compassionchristian.com to join our community. And if you liked this sermon, well, you should check out the rest of the messages from this series in the playlist to the left. Also, click over here if you want to subscribe to see more videos like this one. We'd love to connect with you. Just head to compassionchristian.com slash connect, and I'll reach out to you soon.